you. Well, welcome. Good to have you all this morning to our plenary session. Do you know that marriage therapy can be found in the yellow pages between market and martial arts? <laughs> Couples are usually in the market for a fight, but when they knock on our door as marriage counselors and mentors, they're in the market of hope. Back in graduate school in the mid-90s, um, when my first couple as a marriage and family therapist fired me, I knew I was in trouble and needed to do something different to be a hope giver. The couple was arguing about trash and who was taking trash out. I said, I can solve this. I'll just pull out a chart calendar tell you how, who does what, when, I'm, I'm good. I focused on changing schedules and teaching communication skills, and although that was good, I thought I was brilliant, but clearly, I was missing the heart of their issue. A colleague invited me to look at couples distress through the lens of attachment theory and through a model called Emotionally Focused Therapy and introduced me to Dr. Susan Johnson, the originator of Emotionally Focused Therapy, also known as EFT. This was in 1997 and this began my first of many trainings with Dr. Susan Johnson. Dr. Hawkins said the other day in his talk that there are divine appointments that impact and change the trajectory of our life and career. And this was definitely one for me. Since then, I have integrated faith into EFT and it has transformed my work with couples and also profoundly impacted my own marriage and relationships. I was drawn to attachment theory and EFT for two reasons. First, at the heart of EFT is attachment theory, which says that we're wired for love and relationships and we do our best and flourish in life when we're connected with those who are meaningful to us. This reflects the heart of God. When I first read Attachment Theory, it spoke so deeply to my heart. It reminded me of the prayer we all know, the Shema from Deuteronomy, that Jesus quoted in Matthew 22 when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Boil life down to its bare essence, Lord, what is it? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul and your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like this. Love each other well. Love is a special bond that connects us, and God has wired that into us. The second reason I was drawn to EFT is because it works. In the mid-90s, there ushered a huge change in the marriage and family field. In the early 90s, Susan Johnson wrote an article that said there has been an explosion in the field of marriage therapy. And I'd like to say that Susan Johnson brought attachment theory to the forefront of the marriage and family therapy field and introduced emotionally focused therapy that has rocked the marriage and family therapy field. In 1987, Sue wrote an article introducing the concept that relationships are bonds, attachment bonds. It's the stuff that glues us together. That we seek out the comfort of our spouse and when we're connected, we have this sense of security. And when we're distressed and we feel our spouse isn't there for us, alarm sound that cause us to do crazy things like yelling and defending just to be seen and heard. This might like, sound like common sense, but back then this was revolutionary. 
Since the 80s and 90s, EFT continues to be one of the most influential changes in the MFT field. Emotionally focused therapy has been one of the most researched models over the past 20 years, and it shows that it has about 70 to 75% success rate. And 90% of couples who come to a, a, an emotionally focused therapy, um, therapy say that 90% of them say, wow, that impacted my life. EFT is clearly outlined in nine steps, and it works because it gets to the heart of a couple's conflict. It helps them understand why they're stuck arguing, and helps them bond so they can have more productive conversations and really get across what they want understood. Today, EFT is taught in all major colleges and universities in their counseling programs and continues to shape and influence the marriage and family counseling field. If you want to become a good therapist, no, an excellent therapist, I invite you to look up and read more about emotionally focused therapy. And if you'd like to talk to myself or Sue, we will have a table out back to come and understand emotionally focused therapy in your work as a counselor or lay counselor. A review by APA said of Dr. Johnson's work, Susan Johnson has taken EFT for couples model to a position of great prominence in the field of couples therapy. Dr. Sue Johnson has received numerous awards acknowledging her development of EFT and her significant contribution to the field of marriage and family therapy. She's received the Outstanding Contribution to the Field of Couple and Family Therapy awarded by AAMFT. And she's been indicted into the Order of Canada, which is the greatest civilian honor given by the government for outstanding achievement. Wow, that is amazing. She's a director, yes, that deserves an applause. <laughs> She's the director of the International Center for Excellence in Emotionally Focused Therapy. And can you believe it? Today, Dr. Susan Johnson agreed to come and share with us about creating connections. She is a friend and a colleague, and you will love her accent. Please welcome with me <laughs> Dr. Susan Johnson. Hi, everybody. I'm Sue. Um, and I want to say first, um, because um, it's called emotionally focused, the stuff I do, and it, it, this is in my heart, I want to say that I want to thank Tim and everyone for inviting me here, but I want to say that in the last few days, walking around with you all, I have been completely touched and amazingly honored by how many of you have come up and welcomed me and thanked me for my work and told me that I've made a difference for you and I want you to know that it's completely filled my heart. So, um, So I want to thank you for that, and I'm honored to be here. Now, um, I, if you, I'm the sort of person that if you just stand me up and talk, I will talk to you forever, and you would have to go get your sleeping bags and bring them into the hall. So I've been incredibly disciplined. I've actually got notes, <laughs> and I'm going to try and actually keep to my notes, okay, and not go off on tangents and things. So I was thinking about coming here and I was thinking about my own experience of Christianity, and I thought I would start by telling you that from the age of four to the age of 17, I was educated by the nuns of St. Joseph. And their Christianity was not for the faint of heart. <laughs> I was always on my knees in the chapel, repeating the mandatory 100 Hail Marys that you got for being bad 
And the one thing I'm very proud of in my life is I bet you that I can say Hail Mary faster than any person on this planet. Because okay. <laughs> I was afraid to not say the hundred, right? So I used to say them really fast. So I remember a moment in my last year of school when my headmistress, Sister Teresa Joseph, who was terrifying, okay, um, strode into the classroom and fixed us all with her steely eyes and asked us which one of us had decided to become a bride of Christ, a nun. So there was a very long, tense, paralyzing silence that followed. And everybody stared at the floor. And Sister Teresa was obviously very upset and disappointed by this. And she said in an incredibly scathing voice, she challenged us. She said, girls, just think of the choice between God and a man. <laughs> So the contempt for the second alternative was very clear, okay. So then in this silence, we heard a very small little voice mutter, I'd rather have a man. <laughs> and everybody's eyes pivoted to me because I was the one that was always in trouble. And I said, it's not me, it's not, it's not me, it's not me, honestly, it's not, and it was not me. I want you to believe me after all these years, it was not me. Anyway, it didn't matter because I ended up back in the chapel on my knees again. The point I want to make here is that my headmistress and the girl with the small voice were both wrong. Seeing romantic love and the love of God as somehow separate or even as opposing alternatives. The new science, and it's, when I say new, it's really only about 15 years old, this science, so it's kind of an adolescent, okay? The new science of adult love tells us that attachment to a lifelong partner and the wisdom of Christian faith, which is all about our attachment to God, sing the same song. We are created for connection. And more than this, I suggest that we can create, when we can create a strong bond with our partner, this love opens us up to wholeness and connection with God, just as in a sacred circle, connection with God opens us up and shows us how to love our partner and our family. When I watch a couple in my sessions, and I love seeing a new couple as much now after 30, 35 years as I did way back when, when it was all a big new adventure, okay? But when I watch a couple bond in my office, you know, and I see the synchrony and the connection there, you know, you could call that, if I'm, a, I'm writing a chapter, you could call it a change event in therapy. If I'm doing research, you could call it a point of data, or you could say it's a shift in the couple's, the partner's psyche. You could talk about it in all these ways. But the other thing you could say about it is simply that it's a moment of grace. And it moves me, just like it moves my couples. Until the beginning of this century, human beings had very little understanding of the nature of romantic love, let alone how to make it work. The first recorded love poem written in stone by the king of Ur in ancient Sumeria 4,000 years ago speaks of the beauty of his beloved, but says nothing at all about what love is, how to, how to make it last, so there's absolutely nothing to help us, right? And in all the years that followed, that was basically the picture, love was a mystery. But Christians have had an advantage. They've always had a very special wisdom here. First of all, simply in terms of values. 
the Christian faith presents close relationships as sacred. Somebody asked me the other day, you know, well, you know, you, you, you're not sure you're a religious person, but you say you're a spiritual person. What does that mean? What do you think is sacred? I said, if you ask me that really, it's the connection between people that is sacred. Martin Buber said, when two people connect authentically, God is in the electricity between them. So the Christian faith presents close relationships as sacred. It honors them. It sees them as pivotal in growing and shaping human beings into wholeness. The word whole comes from the same root as the word holy. Christian faith honors the ideal of lifelong partnerships as sacred covenants, not as easily disposable contracts. And as such, I want to suggest to you the Christian message and attachment science have much to offer a society where, um, as John Cassiopeo, the loneliness reacher says, relationships are being reduced from an essential to an incidental, where more and more people are, say they're lonely and have no one to depend on, and where the idea that monogamy is a worthwhile ideal is often ridiculed. We're often told now by so-called experts that a secure lasting bond with a mate is in fact some kind of prison, some sort of prison where self-fulfillment and sexual fulfillment go to die. I don't think so. <laughs> the second element that from an attachment point of view places Christians ahead of the curve, and you heard it in the song. You heard it in this, this incredible man was singing about need, right? The second element that places Christians ahead of the curve in really understanding love is that they are more accepting of adult vulnerability. We have made in our society and in our profession what John Bowlby, the father of attachment science, called an appalling misjudgment. We have glorified the idea of self-sufficiency and we have pathologized dependency. We have called adult partners' need for dependable closeness and support words like lack of differentiation, a weakness, symbiosis, or just plain immaturity. And by the way, maybe not at this conference, we're still doing that very actively out in the world in our professions. But Christianity has always fostered the acknowledgement of human vulnerability and our need for a safe haven to turn to in life. And seen this need as the need to turn to another person, a partner, a fellow Christian, or God as a constructive form of dependency and a source of wisdom. God is a refuge for man. Psalm 59, I will sing of your strength in the morning. I will sing of your love, for you are my fortress, my refuge in times of trouble. The tenets of faith fit with the wisdom of this new science of adult bonding. This science says that romantic love is not some strange mixture of sex and sentiment. It's an ancient, wired-in survival code. It's wired into your genes. It's wired into every neuron in your brain. It is in your bones. And it's wired in, it protects you. It's a wired-in survival code that is designed to keep people you depend on close to you. So we have really, in many ways, I think we've, in secular society, we've completely misunderstood what love is about. The other thing about this science is that it's eminently practical. It tells us what the key elements in love are and how to shape them. We've used this science to create EFT, which is arguably the best um, most effective intervention for couples at this point, for distressed couples, with 17 positive outcome studies and a number of excellent follow-up results. One thing I want to stress here is that for us, in the couple therapy field and in the world of EFT, science and faith are perfectly compatible. 
One story I love is that in 1919, Sir Arthur Eddington, who was a devout Christian, gave a speech to the Royal Astronomical Society proving the truth of Einstein's theory of relativity, a theory that was considered thoroughly sacrilegious at the time. He said that what he'd realized during proving this, the experiment that proved this theory was that Einstein's way of making sense of the universe was so elegant and so beautiful that in it you can hear God thinking. I love that. And I suggest we can say exactly the same for adult attachment theory. The new, this new science links the wisdom of faith and the wisdom of adult attachment beautifully. And I'm gonna try and tell you, because I've only got a little bit of time, I'm gonna try and tell you there's six ways that it's obvious that it does this. First of all, attachment and faith tell us that the deepest instinct in man is the longing for a felt sense of connection with special others parents, partners, and a loving God, emotional isolation is inherently traumatizing for human beings. This longing becomes more acute when uncertainty and danger threaten us, but it's always there. It is biology, it is bred into our bones. Connection with a trusted other tranquilizes our nervous system and helps us find our balance in a stressful world. The need for connection has structured our nervous system and for example, one little example of that is when we make love, we are flooded with a bonding hormone, oxytocin. And that bonding hormone actually helps our brains be more sensitive to the cues that are coming towards us from the person in front of us. It helps us read their intentions more exquisitely. It helps us tune into the expression on their faces. Think about the exquisite elegance of this, the exquisite elegance of that system. The science of bonding has revolutionized how we see and parent our children in the last 50 years. And now it's time for this science and for Christian couples to show the world how to build the lasting bonds that bring us home to a sense of being safe and sound in a loving universe. Can I have the first slide, please? One way of thinking about this is that this little girl's brain, her whole being was born expecting those hands to be there. And for her to survive, let alone thrive, those hands have to be there. The revolutionary thing is that John Bowlby, who didn't really get around to developing adult attachment, said, this isn't just when we're small like this. This goes from the cradle to the grave. The second point from uh, attachment and, and faith is that Attachment says that love is not all about infatuation. It's about seeking a safe haven in life. But that's kind of a big, fat, abstract idea, isn't it? Well, let me just twist it a bit and say, from this point of view, there's really only one core question that couples ask each other, and the answer defines everything. The core question is, are you there for me? Do I matter to you? Will you turn to me when I need? Can I reach and have you respond? Are you there for me? If the answer is anything but yes, I guarantee the relationship is in trouble. But let's just turn this safe haven idea into tangible science. I'm gonna tell you about a little study we did, a brain scan study. As part of a large study on bonding and attachment with distressed, insecurely attached couples in our lab, we put female partners in a brain scan machine and we told them that when they saw an X in front of their face, there was about a 30, 40% chance that they were gonna be shocked on their ankles. I actually thought, felt like a real psychologist for the first time ever because I got to shock people, okay. <laughs> okay, so, and by the way, the shocks hurt. Okay, they hurt, okay, so. Um, so we put them in the machine before couple therapy 
And we, they were in three different conditions. We put them in alone in the machine with a stranger holding their hand or with their partner holding their hand. They're distressed, their relationship's not going well. In all three conditions, when they saw the X, their brain lit up like the 4th of July. Alarm, alarm, alarm. All the alarm bells went off. And if you asked them if the shock hurt, they said yes, it was very painful. What is really interesting <laughs> is that after therapy, when the therapist has structured these bonding interactions for the couple, it was exactly the same when they were alone and with the stranger, 4th of July, pain. It was exactly the same. But this time, when the ex appeared and they held their partner's hand, their brain stayed completely calm. And they reported that the shock was only uncomfortable. It looked like this. Can we have that slide, please? Notice the red looks like the, the 4th of July, and the blue is a resting brain. So after therapy, when the person was holding their partner's hand, who they now feel close and connected with, who's a safe haven for them, the threat comes and their brain stays calm. Um, I did ask my colleague who did this with me, a scientist called Jim Cohn from the University of Virginia, what the blue pieces meant, and he said to me, it means they're not dead, Sue. <laughs> I said, jolly good. Okay, so. <laughs> Changing attachment encounters in the direction of responsiveness changes how the brain operates, how threat is perceived. I just want you to hold that thought for a minute because just think about that. That's really interesting. We do something in therapy, right, and we change interactions. This live thing called a dance of a relationship. We change interactions and that actually turns into a biological response. It, change, it goes from interaction to biology. It changes how our brain perceives threat. Because danger, you cope with danger differently when you are emotionally alone or when the person you can depend on stands beside you. It's a whole different thing. And of course, we read in John, perfect love casteth out fear. Number three, point three, attachment science and the Bible also tells us that love makes us stronger, gives us a secure base from which to go out into the life. Psalm 138. On the day I called, you answered me. You made me bold with strength in my soul. Acknowledging our need and knowing that there's another who has our back makes us stronger. And we see this in couples therapy. People are afraid to admit their vulnerabilities. We are all afraid of rejection and abandonment. But when they're able to speak in a new open way to a partner who is now ready to respond, they find that they and their relationship are stronger. Beautiful study on the results of 9-11 by an attachment researcher called Chris Fraley found that the people who said they had a secure bond, one secure bond, a person they could turn to and confide in and be held by and have be comforted by, they really seem to deal with 9-11. These are people who are really in the area, close to the towers. They really seem to deal with it very well. 18 months later, they were doing very well. Not so the people who said, well, maybe people were there for me, but no, they weren't, and I can deal with it on my own. Right? So this is very concrete at this point. Secure connection being able to turn to another and reach for them and get them to respond to you. Secure connection has been linked in research to every Christian ideal who, the, about who we aspire to be. Security fosters compassion, openness, altruism, resilience to stress, assertiveness when needed, flexibility in problem solving, and most of all, it fosters our ability to balance and regulate our emotions. Um, for those of you who know me, one of my big um, passions in life is I dance Argentine tango. 
It's really silly, but I do, okay? And what, and what you learn about Argentine tango is you spend most of the time in Argentine tango standing on one leg. <laughs> Hours, okay? So, but it's okay because you're in an embrace and this person balances you here and balances you here. And when you start to lose your balance, they bring you back into balance with the embrace. And when you're balanced, you have choice about how you move. You can move in any direction. When you're off balance, totally anxious, or trying to push down all kinds of emotions, you have no choice where you move, you just fall. Okay, so we're talking about connection with other people brings you into emotional balance. And of course, secure bonds with others have been shown to foster greater commitment to one's religious beliefs and a more mature spirituality. Point four, separateness hurts. One of the other speakers said that one way of understanding sin is that it's separateness from God. When we realize we cannot count on anyone and we are isolated, every neuron in our brain knows that we are at risk. This is dangerous. Rejection from others is coded in the same part of the brain and exactly in the same way as physical pain. Your brain doesn't really separate those two. Stepping on a nail's dangerous. Rejection from the person that you need most in the world is dangerous, right? And this is why stonewalling in distressed relationships, shutting down and shutting your partner out is one of the most disastrous responses to marital conflict. It creates a kind of primal panic in the brain. This pain is echoed by religious writers who speak of separateness from God as the dark night of the soul. When um, we, I was writing Creative for Connection with my wonderful colleague, Kenny Sandifer, I went and read the diaries of Mother Teresa. And um, they are amazingly moving. And one of the things that was really difficult to read was that she felt that at some point in her life, a little later in her life, she said she lost her connection with Christ. And she talks about it as an agony of desolation. All this means that when you see unhappy couples in therapy, there is often no point in giving them advice, training them in skills, or reasoning with them, wrong channel. They are in free fall. They are flooded with fear and grief. If you understand attachment, you can help them make sense of and process these emotions and learn how not to trigger their partner and how to send signals that evoke new responsiveness from their partner. When pain and panic hit in relationships, if there's no soothing closeness, we automatically move into anxious flight or numbed out, anxious fight or numbed out flight. Number five, attachment science gives priority to how we deal with our emotions in the dance with special others, what music we play in the dance. And certain emotional styles and strategies and ways of thinking about relationships work much better than others. A secure style where we basically trust other people and we can acknowledge our needs and reach for others offers us the best chance of safe connection. If we can never seem to find this haven, there's really only two other steps that we know as human beings. We end up upping the ante and demanding closeness and going for control. I, why don't you love me? I want us to go on dates. Why don't we go out on dates? And we call this anxious attachment. Or we shut down and try to deny our vulnerability. I really don't need to talk to you. I'm just fine on my own. And we call this avoidant attachment. Most of the time, reaching is the most functional strategy, but if we've been really wounded, this is pretty hard to do. Psychologist Kevin Bird finds that secure folks, when they pray, they pray to the ultimate attachment figure, their God, they pray in a meditative, conversational way. They reach for connection with their God from a place of emotional balance. They invite God in. Whereas when we get caught in anxious attachment, we tend to intensely petition God for help, and we get caught in anger if we don't get what we think we need. Or if we're avoidantly attached, we tend to think that God um, 
doesn't love us anyway, so why invest? And we surround our heart with walls. If God responds, we don't even see it or trust it. These emotional styles play out and define our encounters with our partners and with God. This is good to know because research says that we can always learn to deal with our emotions differently and we can change our attachment style and we know how to do that. When the emotional music changes, the dance, the patterns that define a relationship also change. Lastly, and I like this one best, I think, from um, a point of view of merging attachment and faith. The last link between attachment and the teachings of faith is perhaps the most important of all. Attachment pins down the specific responses that shape a loving bond. The key question, are you there for me? We can think of A-R-E, are you there? Are you accessible, responsive, and engaged? In all our studies of how couples turn their relationships around, we consistently find that these bonding conversations where partners become open, responsive, and engaged uh, predict all the positive um, results of our therapy, satisfaction, trust, and more secure bonding. Kerry opens up to his wife and admits his fear that he doesn't feel that he's good enough for her. He reaches for her reassurance. She responds with reassurance saying that she wants him. She wants him with her. He doesn't have to be perfect. He just has to be there. Their engagement with each other in this moment is like a kind of a trance. It looks just like falling in love. Attachment science tells us that we can come back from times of disconnection and fall in love again and again over a lifetime. That's a miracle. <laughs> but the very best model for all these ARE responses is Jesus himself. Always, in every story in the Gospels, except where he takes the money lenders and drives them out of the temple. Not that one, okay. But <laughs> always in every story, Christ is reachable, especially to people in need. The woman with the issue of blood is one of those stories. She reaches out and she touches his robe and everyone's trying to keep her away from him. And what does he do? He sees her vulnerability and he turns to her and he tenderly responds to her. He joins with her. He shows us exactly what accessibility, responsiveness, and engagement looks like. He shows us in a very specific way how to love. Where do we learn to love? Where does God, if God is about connection, where does he show up in our lives? And I asked myself that when I was thinking about this talk. This image came up for me, so I thought I would share it with you. Sometimes this sense of connection takes us by surprise, but it's always about connection. So I'm on holiday in Morocco in a bustling spice market in the city of Meknes. And a tiny elderly lady is sitting on the stone pathway. Her face is lined. And my sense is that she has gone through more hardship than I can ever imagine. Her head is down, and her hands are held above her head like this. Okay. And she's begging for arms. And I walk past, because we've been told to ignore beggars but I can't. So I go back and I take the money I have and I say in Arabic a phrase that I had just happened to learn by accident the day before. I say, for you, mother. And it still touch it touches me every time I say it. She looks up at me and as our eyes meet, the world shifts there are just the two of us, just us. And in perfect English, she whispers, bless you, my child. And I feel blessed. And I weep 
and weep and weep, and I don't know why I weep. I'm not even quite sure now why I weep. Maybe this is what we mean when we talk of God touching our heart. Attachment, like many spiritual writings, opens the book to the human heart. What is the message here for us as therapists? It is that at last, there is a perspective that makes sense of romantic love, tells us what love is, tells us what makes it work, tells us what derails it. Emotional disconnection derails it. That is the problem. Conflict is the inflammation. The virus is emotional disconnection. For Christians especially, this perspective has to resonate because they have already read John. Anyone who loves is born of God and knows God because for God is love. The couple therapist, in fact all therapists, have to see human beings as primary social, bonding, emotional beings, to see the primary need for connection and to honor it, and to build corrective experiences of connection in your sessions. This is the path to transformation, to what is whole, holy, and for me, the experience of grace. If we look at this child again, do we have the child again? Maybe we don't. If we look at the baby again, remember the baby holding, right? I'm going to ask you, is that really an infant and a parent? Or is that every one of us in the hands of God? Either way, it's all about attachment. So I'm going to end with my favorite hymn, which is also a hymn to attachment. It basically says, you are not alone on the vast ocean of life. And I defy you when you hear these words to not have your heart stir, to not resonate with your body. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens, still with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, oh abide with me. Thank you.